Good morning and welcome to Ideas Have Consequences. And you're joining me in Mexico City. This is not a green screen. I'm actually sitting in my hotel room and what you're seeing behind me is Mexico City. And my, what a, uh, what a beautiful view it really is. Um, we've just been sitting here um, you know, getting everything set up and ready, and we've watched the sun come up. Uh, it's been great. It's an hour earlier here, wherever you are. Uh, it is uh, an hour earlier, it, unless, of course, um, you are in the same time zone. Now, I want to begin by thanking our sponsor for this particular episode, and that is the Birch Gold Group. Now, financial experts thought we were in the clear. They were anticipating around six rate cuts by the end of this year. And then inflation data came out higher than expected. This isn't going away anytime soon. The U.S. is $34 trillion in debt, and yet we keep printing money, which uh, it just drives the prices higher every day for the things that you're paying for. So you can either bury your head in the sand or you can do something about it. Diversify a portion of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation and Birch Gold Group makes it easy for you to own. They'll help you to convert some of your existing IRA or 401k into a tax sheltered IRA in gold, and you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Text IDEAS to 989898 and get your free info kit on gold, and then talk to a precious metals specialist on how to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text IDEAS to 989898. Now, before I take your questions, let me tell you a little bit about what I've been doing. I want to give you really sort of a, a big picture. Though some of you who have been following my work for a while, you know that I travel quite a lot. And just since, gosh, the beginning of January, I have been in um, the UK, Egypt, uh, Italy, Switzerland, um, Colombia, uh, Panama, and now in Mexico. Now, while each of these countries and you know this this journey, um, they have unrelated aspects to them. For instance, like meeting with persecuted Christians in uh, in Egypt or uh, going to the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. They also have um, a connecting thread, and the connecting thread is globalism. It is looking at what the globalists are doing, not just from my perspective um, in the United States, but getting a real picture of what is happening around the world. I, I, I generally feel that my commentary um, is fed by my engagement, not just, not just with my physical neighbors, the people who live you know, around me in my own town and going to a local coffee shop or restaurant or church, but that it is fed by engaging people at every level of society, both high and low, around the world. And there are certain themes that begin to emerge from that. And one of those themes is um, elitists, as I say, not elites, but elitists against populists. This is a global war. So when you are um, seeing in the United States things like, let's say, January 6th, um, or you are seeing uh, in Canada the trucker convoy, uh, it's, not, it's not just in North America. Those things are taking place, those same kinds of protests are taking place all over the Western world. And again, it's populist, which is to say the common people rebelling against what, what are really World Economic Forum WEF overlords. And part of that uh, also has to do with what we're seeing with immigration. And I'll be explaining this in upcoming articles and in a podcast that we'll use 
an, um, you know, a lot of the video that I've been shooting on this particular trip to give you a real picture of what is happening. But my own particular feeling about the immigration crisis is it feels to me like, and I'm speaking generally because I can't, I can't claim to have read what everybody has written about this or said about this um, or to have watched or listened to all their podcasts, but it generally feels to me like almost no one is getting the big picture. There's, there's focus uh, on certain aspects of it, let's say the Darien Gap or stories about uh, some of these uh, migrants making their way to the United States or stories of violence in the United States that is you know, being caused by these people or the policy aspect of the Biden administration. But the, the global perspective, the, the 35,000 foot view of what is happening, it, it sort of feels to me like nobody has really connected those dots. So in, in me doing this, I'm hoping that I'm able to connect those dots for you. And I also want to say this, um, I, I wasn't jumping on some kind of bandwagon and deciding to come down here and cover this. Um, I think I was ahead of almost everyone in doing it because I started it four years ago. I began publishing and speaking on the crisis about four years ago because, um, you know, that's when the, the border surge really began. And it felt to me that no one was asking questions about what was taking place. Now, now it seems like almost everybody is, but it didn't seem to me like anybody was really asking questions about what was taking place on the other side of the border. And by that, I don't just simply mean on the opposite bank of the, uh, the Rio Grande, but I mean, you know, in Central America, in South America, what's going on? How is this happening? So I began traveling all across Central and South America, interviewing uh, some of these migrants, uh, some ordinary people, citizens of uh, some of the countries I was visiting, and getting a, a perspective. What, what do they think about what's happening? Or from the, um, from the standpoint of those who are uh, making their way to the United States, why are they doing it? What are they fleeing? I mean, uh, you know, the, the example I frequently use is, you know, if you had a ranch and there was a stampede of, you know, of, of your cattle across your lawn, you would ask yourself, what's going on over there? I mean, why am I seeing this? What is happening? Uh, is there a brush fire over there? Are there poachers over there? Why are they all stampeding in this direction? I mean, we're not seeing, we're not seeing migrants moving from Texas, from the United States to Central and South America. It's a northward flow. So an obvious question becomes, what's happening in Central and South America that is causing these people to do this? And of course, they're not just coming from there. They're coming from Africa, the Middle East, and from Asia. They're being flown in to South America where they begin their journey. So that was a question I was asking four years ago. And so I was, uh, you know, in Brazil, uh, Colombia on both the, uh, the Eastern and Western side, interviewing loads of Venezuelans, uh, Haitians, Colombians. And, um, um, I, I don't know if I just said this, Brazil, uh, Chile, uh, Peru, a variety of countries. And then I went into Central America and I went to, um, to Costa Rica. And now I've decided to sort of complete the picture because things have changed. And um, I, again, I've probably been in South America 10 times in just the last four years. But now, <laughs> um, you know, now here I am and uh, I've gone to both sides of the Darien Gap, or Darien, you know, as uh, as it's it's pronounced here. I've been to both sides. Uh, I've been into some fairly dangerous areas on this particular trip and on previous trips in order to get that picture. So there you have it. And um, and I've been I've been talking to people high and low, government officials, heads of NGOs, migrants, uh, and. Um, and I hope to be able to give you a, a, a real um, thorough uh, perspective of what is taking place here. Much of what we've discovered has been quite explosive uh, in doing this. So now I'm ready to take some questions from you and um, my producer, JD, 
He is uh, he is sitting comfortably in his desk chair in Dallas, and he's going to read me some of your questions. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear the questions. Hey, Larry. Um, could you go ahead and explain what the Darien Gap is and why it's important for this story? Good morning, JD. If you were here, I would say I would say fetch me more coffee, but you are not. So I will just answer your question. Yes, the Darien Gap. If you you have read my book Around the World in More Than Eighty Days, book that came out in uh, 2020, 2021, I think where I traveled around the world, rating countries and sort of explaining um, the differences between the United States philosophically and, uh, and practically and the countries that I was visiting on that trip, which was about 35 countries, but I only, um, I think I only covered 26 of them in the book so that the, the book didn't go from this size you know, <laughs> to, to this size. Uh, I described the Darien Gap there as a... Um, you know, it is it is arguably, though less so now, um, the most dangerous jungle in the world, and it sits like a cork on top of South America. Now, I, I wish that I had I could turn this again. This isn't a green screen. This really is Mexico City that you're seeing behind me. But I wish that I could turn this into a uh, a map for you and point things out. But so I'll I'll just try to describe it for you. But South America, Colombia, uh, is the northernmost country in South America. And most Americans don't realize how big Colombia is. Colombia is an enormous country. It's almost twice the size of Texas. And um, it's the only South American country that is both on the Atlantic and the Pacific side. So if you are going to um, walk, to hike, to go by bus or something like this, to the United States from South America, you got to go through Colombia, and um, and that takes you, you know, to 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 take the little land bridge that that makes its way, you know, into Panama and northward into the United States. You have to go through the Darien Gap, and the Darien Gap is about sixty miles of dense jungle that is situated between. Panama and um, and Colombia and Panama Colombia you know until the United States uh, armed uh, those people we now call Panamanians against uh, Colombia they used to be a single country um, but now they're separate countries and we we assisted them in a revolution because we were building the Panama Canal and we wanted control of it, and uh, Colombia wasn't interested in letting us have that. So the United States said, fine, we'll just create a separate country. And that's what the United States did. Now, that the Daring Gap has been a very important um, barrier, geographic barrier, to Central Americans against South Americans, not, not generally in the other direction. And that's because um, I think in the minds of many Americans, they they think of something like the, um, you know, the Pan American you know highway, which is stretches from Alaska all the way to the southernmost tip of South America, that you could get in your car and uh, and drive it, you know, the whole thing. But you can't because there's one place that the road is on uh, the road is broken. And that's at Darien. There's no road that goes through the Darien Gap. You have to take a ferry you know, around it and begin your journey. So that jungle has, um, has been occupied by paramilitary types. It has been occupied by drug traffickers, uh, indigenous people. It is an extremely dangerous place. Pestilence, um, you know, uh, <laughs> wild uh, animals. You name it, you can easily die there, and many people do. Now, I will say that something has changed, and that is that now so many migrants are going through the Darien Gap. Last year, north of half a million made their way through the Darien Gap. I mean, that's astonishing. Just say four or five years ago, that was that number was like maybe 20,000 people attempting it. Um, that number is so high now that that a lot of people, I was told uh, quite reliably, um, that a lot of people, they they don't need 
um, a guide to go through it anymore because a trail has been, you know, established by people just going, you know, just walking it, you know, constantly and signposts are being put up to, to direct people where to go. So it's become a lot easier. So when we talk about the Darien Gap being uh, incredibly dangerous, which again, uh, it is, it's not nearly as dangerous as it was five years ago or 10 years ago, where it was virtually impenetrable and um, where it would take you 10 days, you know, to get through it. Now, now it's taking them about three. Next question. So in regards to the danger of the crit of the trip, uh, Tara Lynn Thompson on Twitter says, you're making me a nervous wreck. How does your wife handle this? <laughs> Well, I should. I, I don't want to say too much because I don't. I don't want to give away certain things that are maybe important for my safety and for that of um, of others. But my wife is actually with me on this trip. She, as much as possible, I bring her um, on trips where I'm going to be gone for a very long time. Now, when I was in Europe recently, again, I was in Europe for I don't recall maybe a month. Um, and uh, three weeks, I think, you know, she looked at that itinerary, saw how many countries I was going to be and what I was going to be doing. And she said, no, thanks. <laughs> she wasn't, she wasn't interested in, uh, in doing all of that, but she's been with me uh, in South America. Now, is she going to Darien Gap and to some of these dangerous places? No, she isn't. But as much as possible, I try to stay in, you know, nice hotels, uh, nice places where, um, you know, when I when I come back, um, I can get my laundry done and I can have a good meal and where I know my laptop won't have been stolen and where they take security seriously. And um, and there's a service that can provide me with uh, translators or some real assistance. So I bring her and um, she will stay at the hotels where I disappear, you know, let's say to Darien for a couple of days or to some danger. Like for instance, today I will be gone to these um, Haitian barrios and she'll remain at the hotel and then I will come back um, here, God willing, um, in the uh, in the evening. Uh, Lori's used to this, you know, Lori's my childhood sweetheart. So, um, you know, that is to say we, we met and dated in high school uh, we've been married amazingly almost 40 years and, um, um, she, uh, I usually don't do things that are, that are going to upset her. Um, she's there, there have been a few things I've, I've, I've contemplated doing and I could see by the look on her face that it upset her. And I, I, I don't mean like it angered her. I mean, she was genuinely very concerned. So I try not to do, um, things of that nature, but I think she also trusts my judgment when it comes to stuff like this. And I think she knows that I'm built this way. I'm, uh, it doesn't mean I can't get killed or, uh, you know, uh, kidnapped or, you know, something terrible happened to me. But I think generally speaking, she knows these things energize me and that I am, uh, you know, God made me to do stuff like this. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question here from the YouTube chat. Austin Roos says, uh, what is your opinion on the flood of illegal aliens into our country? Why do you think this is happening? Uh, what does this mean for Americans? Great question. Let me let me say something else on the previous question. Um, I, I also want to be clear um, because I think there were some people on Twitter who thought that I was planning to hike all the way through the Darien Gap. Um, I have no interest in doing that, don't want to do that, did not have any such plans to do that. So what I did was I went by single prop engine uh, to fly into the Colombian side uh, to a place called Nico Cle on um, the, uh, the, the Colombian side of the Darien Gap into a place because the roads were deemed to be pretty dangerous. and. Uh, paramilitary types, you know, on those roads. Now I hear very conflicting things. You'll have one Colombian, you know, who'd say to me, ah, it's easy. You should go and do it. And then I'd hear others who would say to me, Larry, you're insane to get on those roads. You will, he, you'll disappear. And because it was a 12 hour drive and I had no interest in doing 24 hours of driving, you know, going there and back, um, a little twin prop flew us in. And, uh, and it was kind of funny because 
um, flying there, uh, there was only an abandoned runway. And when I say abandoned, I mean abandoned. There were cattle all over this runway, and uh, it's grown up with grass and this kind of thing. But these bush pilots, these South American bush pilots, they're accustomed to doing this stuff. So they just turned back and said, hey, we can't land because we've got cattle all over the runway. So they started doing a number of these low-level flights over the runway to scare the, uh, the cattle off, and then we landed. But it attracted the attention of the police in the nearby town of Nicocli, which is cartel country, uh, a very, very dangerous place. It's the jumping off point to Daring Gap for these migrants who are there selling themselves, selling everything that they have in an attempt to get through the Daring Gap to pay the, the ferry fees and then begin that journey. So they saw our plane circling and the police drove out to the airport, um, you know, come walking through the grass out to the airfield and see our little plane out there and begin investigating us, you know, pretty thoroughly, inspecting the plane and everything to see if we were drug runners. Um, same thing on the uh, on the Panamanian side, but I did not hike through the um, the Darien Gap. I'm, you know, beyond that. There was a time in my life where I hiked the uh, you know the Appalachian Trail. Uh, don't want to do that at this stage of my life. Now, why is this happening um, with immigration? The answer is very simple. The Biden administration has sent a very clear message to the world. Our border is open. It's open. Come on. Come on. That's the message that they have sent. Half a million people don't make their way through the Darien Gap if the Biden administration does not send that message. And they have. And they've also sent the message to the world um, in the kind of stories that you're reading where, you know, one of these, you know, Venezuelan guy, you know, beats up a New York cop in Times Square and uh, suffers no punishment, and then is given a free ticket to California. The, the world knows this. They're seeing this, and they're going, oh, wow. So I guess you could go to the United States and do more or less whatever you want now. Before, we couldn't get in. It was almost impossible to get in. If they found you, they deported you. Not now. The Biden administration has sent the message that our border is open, and not only is it open, but we, the, the force of law will be behind you, we prefer you to American citizens, and we will use taxpayer money to assist you. So everyone, you, you, if you were to talk to anybody here in Mexico City who's reasonably informed and ask them a question about the, the, uh, the U.S. border, they all know that that border is open, and they all know somebody who's trying to make their way through it who, or who already has. The same is true in South America. They all know it. And uh, so that's why it's happening. Um, Susan Benson here on YouTube says, who is flying these people to, to South America, funding and directing them to come to the U.S.? Uh, great question. I was in an NGO in uh, Colombia. Now, gosh, I've lost track of the days, maybe 10 days ago, before this all hit the news in a, in a very big way. Um, you know, we broke the story, you know, on my Twitter feed. And that is, I'm talking to an NGO head, and um, she's telling me um, about the migrants that they're processing. Um, and, and, and by the way, let me say something about this. There are a lot of people who get hung up over what we call them, migrants, criminals, illegals, you know, this kind of thing. That, don't get caught up in all that. It's, I have no ideological agenda in referring to them as migrants. Before they get to the United States, you know, they're migrants. That's, that's what they are. Once they enter the United States, they, they become illegal aliens. Um, but before that, I mean, I, I, I don't want to call them all a bunch of criminals because they're not all a bunch of criminals. They are, and I do want to say this, they are illegal aliens in every country that they are passing through other than their country of origin. So that's very important. It's not just that they because they're illegal aliens when they're in the United States. They're illegal aliens in Mexico and in Honduras and Nicaragua and Guatemala and Costa Rica and Panama and Colombia. They're they're illegal aliens in all of those countries. Um, but this NGO head, you know, is telling me that they're processing. Um, they were being told to process chiefly Venezuelans, Haitians 
and Cubans. And, uh, and I, was, I was asking her, you know, you're assisting them, you're giving them the money, or you're providing some measure of health care, some assistance to, to move on, you know, via bus. And she said, oh, yeah, but she said, but we're flying them now. And I said, what? She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're flying them. We're organizing them. We're putting them on planes. And they're going into the United States. I said, where in the United States? She said, we're not, we're not told. They are undisclosed locations, secret locations as to where they are being sent. A few days later, you see on Daily Mail this very thing being reported. 43 different cities in the United States where they have separated out a portion of the airport, uh, literally you know, blocking it off so that you don't see these people if you're at the airport. They're, they're not coming through you know, baggage claim and and uh, you know passport control the way you might be. They are separating them into a very different part of the airport and then releasing them into the United States. And it's American Airlines and Delta Airlines are both doing it. Now, I don't know who else is involved. I don't know if any South American Airlines like Copa or Avianca you know, are involved in this. I don't know how many of them are charter flights, but they're absolutely doing it. And they're doing it from all over South America. And I want to give credit where credit's due. There's been some, uh, a couple of journalists in South America who work for the New York Times. And I don't like the New York Times as a rule. However, these journalists have done some really excellent work on this. And they've demonstrated that the Biden administration isn't just flying them from South America, they're flying them uh, in from Afghanistan, uh, they're flying them in from Somalia to South America, and then from South America into the United States. So, um, you know, uh, we know of roughly, what, 200,000 that they put on flights? Um, and and I, it, that's, this is another thing I want to say. What you're hearing in terms of the data, don't believe hardly any of it, because I promise you those numbers are way bigger than what you're hearing. If, if you're hearing it's 200,000, it's probably half a million. But again, I'm just speculating. Thanks, Larry. Um, Aaron Shewitt here on YouTube says, what are the key differences between the current administration's approach to the migrant situation and previous administrations? And what lessons can be learned from these differences? Well, I think I think I kind of answered that in the previous question, and uh, that is that they have sent the message that the border is open. Now, Democrats have, you know, as far back as Obama, have been saying one thing and then doing another. Uh, they've been letting a lot of um, illegals into the United States, but they generally pretended they weren't, and they tried to give a little bit of a, you know, the impression that they were, they were defending our borders. That's not what's going on here. Now, I, I this is an election year, um, so I my own theory is that what the Biden administration is trying to do, and now the cat is out of the bag. You know, the American people are becoming more aware of this. Is I think you will see them um, make coming across the southern border uh, into Texas uh, much harder. I think, I think they're going to do that. And I think they're going to give at least the impression of doing that so that they can say, see, we've addressed this, this human flood. We're doing something about it, but they're going to be distracting you while doing that. While with the other hand, they're flying them into the country. So I think they want to, are, are going to want to give the impression by summer that they are are making crossing the border much harder, but they're just going to be bringing in even more people via flights. And, and, and this, is, this is something else that I've discovered. I began asking myself, you know, this question, why is it that they're going to South America? I mean, if you're Chinese, let's say, or from India, and there are a lot of people from India who are making their way from South America into the United States, um, as I say, Somalis, um, Afghans, uh, wh why are you going to South America? Why would you go there? Why not put yourself in Central America, north of the Darien Gap? I mean, why would you put yourself and your children, your wife, through that horror of going through the Darien Gap? Well, it dawned on me, visa requirements, and I began looking at visa requirements in South America. 
multiple countries south of the Daring Gap, which is to say in South America, require either no visa for, let's say, Chinese, or visa upon arrival, or an e-visa, if you know the difference. So an e-visa, um, for instance, as an American, if you go to Colombia, you have to have a visa. But it's not the old clumsy process where you have to literally mail in your, um, your passport and you wait a month or two for it to come back with a visa um, you know, stamped inside your passport that you then use and it has you know, the dates that it's, um, uh, that it's effective. And if, to go to Columbia, an American, you're right there at the ticking counter, you can fill out an online form that is an e-visa and it'll take you max five minutes in order to do and bang, uh, it's done. Same for me as an American citizen going to Egypt. I can pay for a visa upon arrival. Well, Chinese, the, every country north of the, uh, the Darien Gap, Central America, you have to apply for a visa you know, the old fashioned way and you're probably not going to get it. So that means that they go to South America because they can get in to South America and then they pay for their journey to go north. And it's costing them tens of thousands of dollars in order to do it. And the cartels are making tons of money doing this. Now I was talking to, um, let's say Colombians, you know, why would you go through the Darien Gap when it'll cost you, you know, maybe 200 bucks to get a cheap flight from Colombia to Mexico. And then why not walk from there? Why, why wouldn't you do that? Uh, because Colombians, for instance, they don't have to have a visa to get into Mexico. And what they'll tell you is when we fly into Mexico at passport control, they look and go, oh, you're a Colombian. Get on the plane and go back. Get out. We know what you're doing. You're flying here wanting to go to the United States. So that's why they're doing that. That's why they're going south of the Daring Gap and putting their families through this very arduous journey. Uh, related to that, Shannon Finn here on YouTube asks, why are the Republicans allowing this? What about the children? Are they being trafficked? Uh, great question, Shannon. Um, Republicans are allowing it because Republicans, in my opinion, um, but for very few exceptions, they either are very ill-informed, they are themselves profiting from it, or they just don't care. They don't care. Um, I think we're generally dealing with a political class anymore throughout the Western world who are so corrupt, who are so detached from the real world and real people. You know, I said at the beginning of this episode, of this show, that I feel like that part of what's important for me as a writer, as a speaker, as a, um, uh, as a cultural commentator, is engaging with people around the world, ordinary people, as well as people, you know, on top of the pile, um, as it were, because you begin to lose perspective and it isn't necessarily because you, you want to lose perspective or you set out to do so, but even conservative commentators, let's, let's take a, somebody like Bill Crystal. I mean, what, what a jerk that guy is. I mean, he used to be thought of as a conservative. Bill Crystal, I mean, Bill Crystal is, is so far gone and so far on the left. Now, how did he get that way? Was he always that way? My guess is probably no, but he likes his he likes his membership at his clubs and wants to um, clink glasses uh, with the other elitists, uh, and uh, he doesn't want to lose that. Uh, he's just the lost perspective of what real life is like and what's happening for real people. You get to a place where you're unaware and you are insulated from it, and you don't care. So I think I think that's a that's a that's a big part of what is happening in this. And remind me of the the full question there, JD. Sure. Uh, Shannon asked, "Why are the Republicans allowing this? And ah. what about the children? Are they being treated? yes? So that that takes care of the first part of the question. I, I I just think they've, you know, Mitch McConnell. I mean, Mitch McConnell is part of the Uniparty. Uh, let's just be clear and. 
it seems to happen to a lot of congressmen, you know, that people that you, you had a lot of, um, you know, hope for, they go to DC and they are, they're seduced by the machine there or blackmailed or, or something. But I think generally speaking, they're just, they're just seduced by it all. And they see an opportunity to enrich themselves and to enjoy a life of, of, of splendor. Uh, are children being trafficked? Absolutely. Um, human trafficking is a massive global problem. I wrote about it uh, in a book about Ukraine that I published in, uh, well, Harper Collins published in 2011 called The Grace Effect. My first book, which is something of a theological treatise, but deals with the history of Ukraine, my own, gover- my own uh, uh, interactions with that extremely corrupt government and um, with the human trafficking um, aspect of what goes on in that government. Well, same thing um, in South America. Listen to Nico Klee, the, um, the Colombian town that I was talking about where we landed on an abandoned airfield, you know, with the cattle. That, that town used to be a, a kind of a resort town. It's uh, Colombia's equivalent of let's say Panama City, um, that, that is say Panama City, Florida, not Panama City, Panama, um, Fort Walton Beach or something like that. It was a beautiful beach town. Now it is absolutely flooded with these migrants who are waiting to catch a ferry across the Gulf there and to begin their march through the, um, the Darien Gap. They're all waiting. And maybe they've paid and they've been put in the queue. You know, you're going to go on a couple of days or they don't have the money and they're trying to get the money. Now, if you don't have the money, how do you get it? Well, some of these people, not all of them, some of them are selling themselves. Um, they're committing, you know, crimes of one kind or another, uh, perhaps uh, individually or because they're working um, with the cartels that are there. Um, and in some instances, children are disappearing or even being sold. I mean, these are the kinds of stories that you hear. And apparently there is a big market for children. Uh, so human trafficking is a real thing. And then, of course, what is happening to people as they're going through the Darien Gap? Uh, Darien Gap itself, there's plenty of bandits there. And um, when I was on the northern side of the Darien Gap, which I want to say, you know, again, the, the southern side is the Colombian side. The northern side is the Panamanian side. Uh, I was engaging with Centerfront. Centerfront is the um, uh, the frontier uh, army, the border patrol, if you will. And Centerfront um, uh, struck me as, as much more professional. They struck me as having much more of a plan. And um, one of the reasons I really didn't get into any real dangerous stuff on the northern side is because Centerfront was very concerned that something might happen to me. It was, it was almost amusing because with my translator, they were kind of like, look, if something happens to you, eh. Um, but to him, he's an American, and if something happens to him, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble, and you're very gringo. You know, they would just say, look, I mean, you know, you're tall, that shock of hair of yours, you, you, you can't, you don't blend in and you will be a target, you know, for the cartels or for militias. So we did go, uh, you know, into the jungles, but they didn't let us go. They didn't let us go too far, um, because of this. And, uh, and it's because again, human trafficking is a real thing there. It's, uh, you know, you have women who are being raped there, dead bodies decomposing on the trails. Um, one of the guys that I was, uh, talking to who, um, he, he goes in, uh, on horseback, um, taking a couple of horses with him that are carrying supplies that he in turn sells to these people as they're coming through the Daring Gap, everything from bottled water to, you know, to food and, um, you know, uh, footwear, you know, what have you, he, you name it. He has a little, you know, he's, he's got this little extemporized, um, you know, 7-Eleven that he's established deep into, you know, the Darien uh, jungle where he's selling these things. And uh, here I am talking to him about this. And he says he sees dead bodies all the time. And um, at first I asked him if there's much of a criminal element. And 
he said no, and then he went on to describe the criminal element. And, and I think what he was trying to say is that it's becoming a little bit more rare on the Panamanian side, and that's because uh, Centerfront has, uh, has a stronger presence there. Awesome. Um, related to that, one question I have here is, um, have you had any run-ins with the police or cartels? And um, what has that been like? Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's a good question. And the answer is, is yes, um, I have. But it depends on how we're defining run-in. If we, if we mean an unpleasant encounter, the answer is no. Now, as I was describing, when we flew in into um, Nico Cle on the uh, on on the Colombian side of the Dairy Gap on this abandoned um, airport, um, the police in the nearby town, as I say, they saw us. They saw our plane circling, and uh, and they came out and they were like, "What in the world? Nobody ever lands on this air on this airport on this on this airfield." Who are you? You know, and they thought I might be DEA. Now that has been, it has been supposed that I am DEA, CIA, or FBI on several occasions. And uh, a quick Google search, generally speaking, um, provides clarity on that. I mean, I'm very Googleable, and you can see that you know, they can easily see me on CNN or Fox News or on Al Jazeera or BBC or being written up in the New York Times and. My, my my street cred is uh, is is there when you when you search that. So when they ask, you know, and and maybe maybe don't initially believe me. Once I just do a little something and show them on my phone, and say, you know, see, here's a piece that I wrote for, you know, the Atlantic, you know, whatever. Then they then they begin to go, okay, so you're a little you're you're a le legit um, journalist. Um, we get it, but they still inspect the planes. Um, still inspect us really carefully. I posted a video yesterday, a center front, uh, German shepherd sniffing my backpack, sniffing me, sniffing the plane. I, I didn't resent them doing that at all. I appreciated that they were trying to do their jobs. They were taking very seriously drug trafficking, also potential human trafficking. Now they never thought we were doing that because you just easily look and see that it was me and a, you know, a couple of pilots and a translator. That's it. So, I mean, we, we, we didn't have 30 people with us who were, um, you know, being smuggled somewhere. But they, um, I thought this was fascinating. And then on the Colombian side, you talk to the police, you know, because there's a lot of rumors that, all, that, that, that the police themselves work for the cartels. But what the Colombians have done to try to prevent some measure of corruption is that they're cycling, cycling these police officers through this border patrol quite regularly. So I did not meet a single uh, police officer on the Colombian side of the Daring Gap who had been in one of those towns for more than three months. And that's because they move them out to another town and then to another town and to another town. That's to prevent the corruption and they bring someone else in. Um, as for the cartels, um, a lot of my Colombian friends were very concerned that I was going to some of these places because they would say, look, you know, you're going into cartel country. I'm, I'm a Colombian. It's dangerous for me. I wouldn't go there, but you, I mean, look at you. This is very dangerous for you. Uh, I had reasoned that it really wasn't going to be that dangerous for me for the simple reason um, that, A, I am an American and the cartels are in business here. What interest do they have in bumping me off? What interest do they have in, uh, in doing me harm? They want to keep that human traffic queue moving. They're making a lot of money off of it. I don't think they're interested in me at all. And as it turns out, it appears they didn't because I didn't, I didn't have any, uh, any difficulty at all. Now, you have to be aware that when you're in some of these towns, that the, the cartel knows you're there. They are there and they are watching you. And they generally warn you with children. It's not usually a, a guy who comes over and says something to you. It's a 10-year-old or a 13-year-old or 15-year-old who comes over and says something to you like you shouldn't be here. And when you, when you get that warning, you need to move off. Because the next time 
it's not, it is going to be a guy and it's going to be a guy who's, you know, who's armed. And one of the things I don't have down here is, is I am not armed. And uh, Centerfront, when I was going to go into, you know, heading into the Dairy Gap, they wanted to send special forces with me. That's how dangerous they think it is. And uh, they would not let me go unless I took special forces with me. Have you talked to any immigrants and what are they saying on the road? Yeah, um, another very good question and an important question. And this is the part that I find the most upsetting because I see a lot of conservatives on Twitter attacking these people, you know, um, uh, referring to them all as criminals, referring to them all as terrible people. Listen, part the, for me, my conservatism is rooted in, you know, not in uh, some kind of classical Greek tradition, uh, as some would say. My conservatism is, uh, is the conservatism of an Edward, um, uh, <laughs> um, Edmund Burke, excuse me. Uh, it's rooted in my Christian faith. I have talked to a lot of these people. And I mean a lot of these people. Many of them are simply desperate people. Many of them are the kind of people who have the mentality of those who did establish the United States, who are willing to get on the Mayflower, who are willing to get on, you know, the mass immigration into the United States was between 1880 and 1920. That's where, where um, the United States saw a massive influx from Italy, Poland, uh, some from Russia, um, and um, you know immigrants, Ireland, you know who were coming to the United States during during that period of time. These are desperate people, desperate people. Now, does that mean that I think we should let them in? No, doesn't mean that. I think that two things can be true at once. We can feel compassion for many of these people, and we can also have a sensible. Um, you know, immigration policy, and we can defend our border. But you're often talking about people that if you were in their circumstances, you would do what they're doing. You would, because we're talking about individuals who are fleeing frequently socialist countries, like, say, Venezuela, um, where uh, the stories you hear, and they're, they're, they all have a pattern. They all go something like this, that 10 years ago, um, they were a single income family. Dad worked as a mechanic, a laborer, a teacher, um, a, a, a truck driver, and he could support his family. And then he couldn't. And then his wife was working to try to support the family. And then they were skipping meals so that their children could eat. And then there wasn't enough food even for the children to eat. And dad is unemployed and so is mom and they're begging on the streets and they finally decided we're going to try to go through the through the the troches the troches are the illegal pathways between these countries so many of them coming out of venezuela into colombia the colombians didn't want them either they weren't weren't giving them work visas you know into colombia so they're going into those countries and one of the reasons why it's predominantly males in Centerfront told me I'm, I'm going from memory here, the 75% are males. 75% are males. Now, one of the reasons for that is that I do believe, and Centerfront off record agreed with me in this, that a lot of these are military types who are being sent into the United States by their governments as sleeper cells to do harm. I suggested that to a Centerfront, uh, a colonel, and he said to me, you're Absolutely correct. So I, there is that element. Another element is that they're criminals. You know, many of the, you know, these people who are coming out of Venezuela and, and Haiti, Somalia, a lot of these people are criminals. That is true. But another reason why most of them are males is that the men are being sent. Uh, like immigrants come to the United States, they are coming first to establish a beachhead for the family to find a job, a place to live, and then to send for their families to come as well. So that's one of the reasons that that's happening. Some of these people, I found myself giving them money because I'm, I'm looking at people who are sleeping on the ground with a trash bag 
over their head and they got nothing to eat. I mean, nothing to eat. We're talking utter desperation. Women carrying a baby and wearing flip-flops and, you know, holding a bottle of water going into the Darien Gap. I mean, this is insanity. But this is how desperate these people are. And it's worth stating, anyone who is desperate enough to do that, a wall is not going to stop these people. A wall isn't going to stop this flood. What has to be done to stop the flood is the United States... Federal government must send a very strong, unequivocal message that our border is closed. And if you come here illegally, we're shipping you out. Do not come to our border. We are going to take an aggressive stance against illegals. That number that's going through, that half million number that I just mentioned, that came through the Darien Gap in, in uh, uh, 2023, that number would drop back down to those lower levels of previous years if the if the government did that. But the government isn't doing that. And so desperate people, and I mean desperately poor, are coming to the United States. And you should feel compassion for those people. Many of them want to stay in their own countries. The United States is doing nothing to help them stay in their own countries. We're doing exactly the opposite. And, and I should also say this talking about the criminal and military element that's coming into the country. Same Senate front a colonel that I was talking to, he said, and he used the word suicide, he said, Central Americans, South Americans, we are all asking ourselves, what is going on in the United States that it has chosen to commit suicide? I want to be clear. These countries don't want these people. The Colombians... and. <laughs> One of my translators, he, he finished the sentence for me but because of so, uh, before I could say it. But I said to him, you know, I said, you need to understand that to Americans, everything south of Texas is, and then he said, Mexico, <laughs> which is funny. And uh, I, I, so one of you could draw a little clever, you know, map for me where it just shows it's Central America, South America is all just Mexico in the American mind. These countries all have fairly distinct national characters. They're very, very different countries. I know it seems that, that those elements that are Spanish-speaking countries, that is to say everything other than Brazil, that they're all more or less the same. They aren't. Colombians are not big fans of Venezuelans. They don't want them. From their point of view, they think that the, the, the reputation of Venezuelans, which isn't, isn't completely fair, but the reputation of Venezuelans to Colombians is that they don't want to work and that they're criminals. Colombians don't want them. Panamanians, Panama is, it feels more like Miami, if you're in Panama City, that is. It's, um, it's, there's more money flowing. The U.S. dollar is the c currency. Um, you know, Lori and I were at dinner one night and sitting next to us is, are these young, hip, 20-something couples. You know, it looked like they were out for somebody's birthday party. They, you know, there was nothing rough about them. None of them looked like they'd ever worked a day. And in other words, they could all be Americans. None of them looked like they'd ever worked with their hands, you know, at any point in their lives. Those, those kids who are sitting at that table and they're all well-dressed and this is a nice restaurant and they've all got their iPhones and they're all doing selfies. I mean, they're all just like a bunch of American kids. They have nothing in common with their Colombian equivalents. And if you mention Colombians to Panamanians, they go Pablo Escobar, drugs. They don't want a road through the Darien Gap because they don't want those people coming through there. So what is happening is that all of these countries have decided, after pressure from the United States, we will facilitate these people to come through our countries. We are not facilitating them staying in our country. The United States wants, us to, wants to pay us, um, put pressure on us, to assist Venezuelans to pass through uh, and go all the way to the United States, we'll do it. We'll do it. We're going to send them on. We do not want them. So Panamanians don't want Venezuelans or Colombians or Brazilians settling in Panama. And Mexico doesn't want any of these people either. So they're sending them. They just keep, they, they've, they've established a, a, a system, a highly organized system to send these people to the United States. Thanks, Larry. 
we're kind of getting close to time here. I have a question, or I have a, yes, I have a question here from Dale Gotham. He asks, Larry, what can we do to share your work on this incredible invasion? More and more Americans need to hear what is going on. You know, that actually is probably a question for you, JD, because all I know to do is to keep producing the content that I produce. And um, I try to work hard. You know, it's like the old Scrubbing Bubbles commercial of my youth. We work hard so you don't have to. I think hard so you don't have to. Um, you can help us try to get our work out. Um, I'm sure that we're being suppressed on several platforms and therefore getting this content out is, um, is very, very hard. We need an army of people. We need the posse to help us get this information out. I, going back to the, to the previous question, this is a very important aspect of this that I really want to drive home. When I was here, when I was here first, I mean, it was my first time in South or Central America, but when I was, when I was here to begin this project for the first time, say maybe four years ago, what you had were, were migrants who were working as individuals or as families or maybe as groups trying to make their way to the United States. In other words, it was highly disorganized um, it was, it was just an ad hoc mess. There were, you know, some NGOs that would help some people, some churches, um, um, you know, maybe a Facebook group or two, not anymore. Four years later, this is now a highly organized machine. And, uh, and I didn't fully maybe answer a question that was asked towards the beginning, what what agency is helping people do this most is the United Nations, and it's through uh, OIM. I've noticed their banners, their logo almost everywhere that I've gone, and that's the Office of International Migration. They are the ones who are doing it. But you'd be naive if you thought that wasn't the United States doing it through them. This invasion is being facilitated by the United Nations, but the but the United States is using the United Nations as a proxy to do it for them. That is to say, the Democrat Party is doing it through OIM, which is funded by the United States, is funded by the American taxpayer. I personally believe that the monies for this mass invasion, it's being laundered through Ukraine. You wonder where those billions are going and why Democrats are so dedicated to sending money to Ukraine again and again and again. Well, some of that money is coming back uh, you know, into their own pockets. But I would argue that, and I believe this in my bones, I, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I believe in my bones that that money is being used um, to fund their globalist projects. And one of them is this mass, in, uh, mass uh, invasion of the United States. And OIM, the Office of International Migration from the UN, is, is one of the, the, the main ones that, that's doing it. Point is, four years ago, it was highly disorganized ad hoc. Now, it's a massive human trafficking. And I want to emphasize this. The Biden administration is engaging in human trafficking. They are running the biggest human trafficking op in the history of mankind with your money. That is what they're doing. And they don't care about these people. They don't care about them at all. Uh, they don't care how many of them get killed or trafficked or uh, by somebody else other than them or raped or, you know, they, they don't care. They're simply using them cynically for their own political purposes. That's what's happening. No one else in the world would have the ability to organize this kind of mass movement of people other than the United States government. Thanks, Larry. Uh, we're going to close out here pretty soon, but do you want to give us a glimpse into what's coming next on your trip? Well, home. <laughs> I hope soon. Um, to recap, I, uh, I, I started this part of the journey. I was in Europe and I was in Africa. I came home for 10 days and then I went um, directly uh, to Colombia from Colombia uh, to Panama City, Panama, and then um, now here to Mexico City. So 
Uh, a gentleman will be meeting me downstairs in just a few minutes uh, where we will begin um, to do um, um, some look around the city here, uh, engaging with migrants who have made their way through the Darien Gap and are now making their way to the United States. These will be Haitians, uh, chiefly in some Cubans, I'm told. So we'll see what will happen there. I'll be here for this week, but I'm going to try, J.D. I've told my wife, I've, who, has, who has chastised me, um, uh, <laughs> uh, for working too hard. So I'm hoping to enjoy maybe a day or two here where maybe I try not to work for a couple of days before I head on home. Thanks for the update, Larry. Do you want to give us any closing statements or encouragements before we sign off? Yeah, well, I just I want to end the way I try to end. Everyone, keep your head high. Um, I see a lot of Christians. I see a lot of conservatives who feel it's over. It's over for America. Um, you know, all is lost. If I believe that, I wouldn't do what I'm doing. Uh, Jesus changed the world with 12. Um, according to the data, according to Pew Forum, 26% of Americans... I self-identify as evangelical Christians. That is to say, people who answer affirmatively to questions like, do you believe that Jesus is the only way, the Bible is true, a literal heaven, a literal hell? Um, you know, um, are these the things you believe? I, I, think we, I, I think we have to become better organized, and I think we have to get our message out, and I think we have to stop sitting on our hands. Do something. Engage your local representatives, your state representatives, your federal representatives, and begin to hold them accountable. And pray. Uh, pray. This, this is all very, very important. But I believe in a great God. I believe in a God with a capital G. And uh, because of that, I play to win. That's, that's why I do what I'm doing.